It is decision week for LJ McCrae. LJ is a five-star defensive lineman. He's out of mainland. They're in Daytona, Florida. We are going to talk to experts from four different universities to get their gauge on how this recruitment is going. You will want to stick around and see this. LJ is a 6'6", 275-pound defensive lineman with freakish athleticism. He's the number one defensive lineman according to On3. He's number two on 247. He's a five-star on both those sites, and we are excited to see where he picks on Saturday. But before we do that, we're going to talk with Zach Blostein of Knowles 247, Blake Alderman of Swamp 247, Gabby Uridia's Inside the U reporter, and Graham Coffey from Dogs Central. Make sure that you stay tuned because you're going to enjoy this. Let's chat with the guys. All right, I've got Graham Coffey from Dogs Central on. Talk a little bit of LJ McRae from UGA's perspective. Um, Graham, what is, not that they really need a, a great one with their success over the last couple of years, but what is what is UGA's true pitch to LJ? A, a loaded defensive class line room anyway. Um, what is What is their big pitch to LJ at this point? I mean, I think the pitch is look at all the guys that we've had drafted in the NFL over the last couple seasons, right? Uh, Devontae Wyatt, Jordan Davis, jo uh, Jalen Carter, all first rounders, all seemingly having successful careers so far. You had Trevon Walker be the number one overall pick. So I think it's pretty straightforward. I mean, even, even Nolan Smith last year uh, – kind of playing that more true edge position, that Jack linebacker in Georgia's mid front, uh, which could be sort of where McCray projects, depending on how he develops from a physical standpoint. So I, I think the results speak for themselves. Um, the negative side, or I think where Georgia's having to fight negative recruiting in all defensive line recruitments right now is that they don't really play a system that that asks their guys to just like pin their ears back and go rack up sacks. You know, they want to collapse the pocket. They want to play team defense instead of like shooting gaps on first and second down. And so I think that's kind of the, the other side of the coin from uh, Georgia's standpoint is to say, hey, yeah, like these guys maybe didn't have, you know, 15 sacks in a season when they were here. But look what the NFL thought of them. Look at the amount of money they're making now. Yeah. Relationships are always big in recruiting, even with this new NIL world that we're in. And uh, LJ has got a pretty good relationship with Kirby smart and the staff there. Can you just talk about um, some of the relationships that he's got with the, uh, with the staff up there in Athens? Yeah. I mean, Kirby's always going to be involved in a recruitment that's this high profile, particularly when it's on the defensive side of the ball. Um, Trey Scott would be the one that I think is probably even more significant in, in this particular recruitment with McCray. Just he is the defensive line coach. Uh, you know, he is the guy that has kind of been responsible for developing and finding some of those players we mentioned earlier. Um, you couple him with uh, Chidera Uzo Jaribe, who is the uh, outside linebackers coach. And, you know, you've got two younger guys that I think probably relate a little bit better to today's prospect than, you know, um, even maybe a Will Muschamp does at this point in his career, right? So I, I think Georgia's got guys that, that know how to have genuine relationships. David Cooper, the recruiting coordinator, is really, really good at, you know, talking about things that are not football related and, and being genuine about that. Like, not just like, oh, let's talk about your family, but um, – actually you know actually caring about it so I, I think Georgia from a relationship standpoint is in as good of a spot as as you could hope to be in this recruitment it's it's just a uh, you know sort of how does everything else weigh out for him top five of UGA Florida State UF Miami Auburn in there as well who do you think is Georgia's biggest competition at this point I think this is a Georgia FSU recruitment. Um, that's at least the the buzz that we're hearing today. Uh, you know, I, I think Florida, you and I were talking off air before we recorded this. Like, it did feel like Florida was kind of there and maybe in the lead at, at some point in this one. I don't know what's happened there exactly, but it does feel like the intel we've gotten over the last 
week or so is is that they're they're kind of maybe fading a little bit and and this is a, a Georgia Florida State. Um, Graham, I appreciate you joining me. Where can people find your work? Where can they follow you and and hear more about uh, not only LJ but recruiting and UGA from from your perspective? Yeah, you can check us out uh, dogcentral.com. Um, you know, we have a lot of uh, free articles there in addition to uh, subscriber type intel that we give out for Georgia fans. Uh, follow me on Twitter at Graham Coffee DC and uh, on YouTube, uh, podcast, all of that, just uh, Dog Central. Cool. Well, we appreciate it, man. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. All right, Blake Alderman with Swamp 247. Let's talk a little LJ McCray. Uh, Blake, what is... What has uh, UF's pitch really been to to LJ uh, throughout this recruitment? I, I think there's a, a couple things that they've put on there. Uh, obviously, early playing time, you look at Florida's defense. I mean, I think overall in the entire roster, they played 11 freshmen this season. So it's that there is early playing time available, and that's being backed up by what you see on the field. I think that uh, kind of the trajectory of that program is another thing because one thing that was interesting when talking to LJ a couple months back when I was by there was – um, he took his official visit in June and it was kind of his chance to hear what the coaching staff's plan is for this program, where they see things going. And, and they told him that, you know, this is a rebuild. You know, I think that Florida has been pretty upfront with kids that, you know, this isn't a, you know, we're going to win them all type situation where Florida is like, it's very much a rebuild. They're very much trying to build something for the future. And I think that LJ, one thing that, like I said, that, that mentioned that he mentioned that, that stuck out to me was he said that he's been part of a rebuild at mainland. That is traditionally a good high school program. They've had plenty of state championships. They've had plenty of games where they played in state championships, really good teams, really good players that have come out of that program. But when he started there in high school, that wasn't the program there to where it was last year when they were playing in a state championship game. He's been a part of a rebuild. He understands what that takes. It's not something that necessarily scares him. So I I think that weirdly he, he does seem somewhat interested in being part of a team where you build something, where you're putting something together. Um, on top of that, too, the relationships are something he's really high on, uh, really likes a lot of the pieces that Florida has in their class so far. It's close with some of those guys. So I think it's just really the relationships that, that he's built with those guys, um, being a part of a rebuild, having that early playing time. I think NIL matters for every kid in some sense. You know, I think that anytime you're going you're gonna to give me some money to play some football and go to your school, I think any kid is, gonna, is definitely going to be into that. So I think it's kind of a combination of all those things are, are really kind of what Florida's pitch is. Yeah, who uh, who do you see as Florida's main competition here? Uh, as we get just a few days away from him making a making a pick and deciding where he'll go, uh, you know, it's funny. It it seems like it's you know different day, different team. I guess now that we're hitting that final stretch, which is pretty common whenever you do start to hit that that decision date. Early on, I thought it was Georgia. I thought it was Florida Georgia, and that's the two teams that really more talked about more than anything. I feel like now that it's getting towards that final stretch, there's a lot more Florida State talk. Florida State's being talked about a lot more uh, coming out of that official visit. He was there in Orlando for their win over LSU. I think before the season started, FSU hadn't got him on campus before that that time in August in in Orlando. Um, I think it was in the spring. I think he last visited there. If he didn't pop in in June, I can't recall off the top of my head him popping there in the summer. Um, But it had been a while. So Florida State really kind of went from a team that, yes, they were involved. Yes, they were a top school. But they really didn't start to get the buzz that they were starting to get until the season came around. So at this point, I think that for me, I've been saying it that he's got a top five. It's Auburn, Florida, Florida State, Georgia, and Miami. At this point, I don't know that I'd be shocked if he picked any of the three out of Florida State, Georgia, and Florida. I'd be very shocked if Miami or Auburn were the pick. Um, but I think at this point, the buzz on Florida State is probably growing more than any of the other schools in the, in the mix for him right now. One more and I'll let you go. Does LJ strike you as the kind of kid that uh, picks a school on Saturday and kind of shuts it down, focuses on his high school year? Or do you think that, you know, I know the other schools, the other four will continue to push, but is he one that you see more being open after this commitment or probably locking it down and, and focuses on the rest of his year? I think he locks it down. You know, I don't know if this is a point to where if a school wants to continue to have conversations with him, um, if he'll just shut those down. Because I feel like now in the world of transfer portal, coaches are always on the move at different jobs. You never know how that's going to work out. I think kids in general just don't want to burn bridges. I think that that keeps the conversations going. But I do think that, you know, LJ is – 
I mean, that is exactly what you want in a kid in any college program. He is um, he's got the frame. He's he's got the athletic ability, but he's also really a true pro. Like at, at a high school level, you haven't seen a kid that really seems to be as grounded as him. And I think that's obviously a testament to his support, you know, crew around him. His parents, his father uh, was a was a college coach at Bethune Cookman, um, so he kind of grew up as as a as a football guy. You know, I think he he understands. Um, that this is a business decision in a sense of playing time, looking at all those things. And, and I think that you've got a guy too, that didn't make a decision in June. This wasn't a, or in the summer, didn't make a decision there, wanted to continue to see how these teams played in the fall. If some of the things that these schools said in the summer backed up on the field, where the trajectory of these programs were, I just think you've got a kid that has really done his due diligence and has taken every Avenue who he can to make sure that he's making the right decision. So I think that if, I would be surprised if he takes visits after the fact or if he still continues to hold court. I don't know that I'd be surprised if conversations are still had because, like I said, you know, you don't want to burn any bridges. But I think that this is a kid that has taken all the necessary efforts to make sure he's making the right decision. So I think it's going to be tough sledding for anyone to sway him if he does make that decision on Saturday, when he makes that decision on Saturday. Yeah, makes sense. Blake, I appreciate you for joining us. Where can people find your work, follow more about your uh, coverage and Last minute updates on LJ this week. <laughs> yes, uh, Swamp Twenty Four Seven. It's Florida's Twenty Four Seven Sports site. Um, it's Florida Twenty Four Seven Sports dot com. I'm on Twitter at Blake underscore Alderman. A lot of my content is on there as well. So I don't know that many of uh, many of your watchers and listeners are going to be big Florida guys, but if you guys want to come over and make fun of me. That's the place to find. <laughs> I'm sure that uh, one way or the other, they'll they'll want to read uh, what the board says on uh, on Saturday. So. Um, good stuff. I appreciate it, Blake. Thank you so much for joining me. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. I want to give some love to my buddy over at Knapp Accident and Injury. Alexander Knapp is a diehard FSU fan, FSU grad um, who now works in the personal injury space. If you are hurt or in some kind of an accident, whether that be an Uber and Lyft accident, whether that be a commercial type accident, any kind of injury give my buddy a call 813-568-3724. You can also go to their website, NAP Accident and Injury. Um, they are going to be doing a giveaway that we're finalizing right now for the Miami game. I know that we got Duke this weekend. I know there's a lot of excitement around that. We're going to be doing a ticket giveaway with NAP Accident and Injury for the Miami game. Make sure that you're supporting Knowles. If you're hurt or injured, or if you know somebody who's been hurt or injured in an accident, make sure that you give them Alex's number. He's one of the best to work with. You get his personal info, not dealing with a paralegal or case manager. Make sure that you're supporting my buddy Alex Knapp. He's a big knoll. He'll talk a little FSU with you, and then he will take care of you if you need his services. All right, inside the use, Gabby Uridia. Gabby, LJ McCray's decision week here. And let's start with this. Florida State, Georgia, Florida, thought to be kind of the, the heavy hitters. Maybe Miami and Auburn, for a lot of folks, maybe thought to be in like a second tier or an afterthought, but that might not be the case. Talk to me a little bit about Miami maybe surging here on the last week and, and really becoming a player in this thing. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I guess, look, I mean, for what it's worth, I think internally, like at Miami, just between those guys, they feel like they're, you know, they feel like they're very much in the thick of this thing. And look, I mean, we've kind of, from my perspective, like kind of seen this song and dance before, uh, just with a lot of these other defensive line recruits. Uh, you know, they, they've kind of been in that, top tier of guys, obviously, you know, well reported, at least from my end, that their goal this cycle was to sign an elite defensive line class. Uh, they've come close, you know, they got Artavius Jones, which is of course a big win, but they've, you know, missed on a lot of other top targets. LJ McCray is really the last one, you know, LJ McCray is kind of like the find their final opportunity to kind of accomplish what they, you know, feel like they can accomplish, which is just sign a top tier defensive tackle type. And look, I mean, truthfully, uh, you know, we know the world that we live in right now. We don't got to be, be too shy about it. But cards, I mean, you know, decks kind of, you know, or chips kind of pushed to the middle of the table right now. So, uh, you know, take that for what it's worth. And, you know, they're going to they're gonna do what they got to do to kind of stay in this and to push for an LJ McCray uh, commitment. I mean, they are they're, they certainly don't feel like they're outside of that top three. Uh, who knows what the, what the reality of it is? I think that that's probably – you know, tough to decipher, especially in some of these high profile recruitments. And look, I know it's what Tuesday uh, commitment coming on Saturday, but I still feel like there's a lot of time left on the clock. And, and look, I, there's been other recruitments where on Tuesday, it may not, it, it may have looked a certain way. And by Saturday, it looks, it looks differently. And 
you know, obviously not picking at you, TJ, obviously, you know, Florida State and all that stuff, but like the Zaquan Patterson situation, and obviously two different, totally different recruitments. But if you asked me on Tuesday, hey, where do you think Zaquan Patterson's coming? I probably would have said Florida State. And then, you know, Friday, Saturday come around and, you know, started to really trend towards Miami. Um, and again, I'm not saying that that's what's going to happen here, but uh, look, I think that this is high profile recruiting, high stakes recruiting. I think uh, for Miami, again, there's a lot riding on this LJ McCray recruitment. And uh, again, I, I personally feel like, uh, again, I, okay. I don't know if I personally feel like this, but they internally, they feel like they are in this recruitment, um, you know, and they're going to continue to work at it and kind of just see what happens. I don't know that Miami's going to get LJ McCray. Uh, I personally don't feel super confident about that at this point. But uh, I think we've seen crazier things happen. And with this staff, I've learned that they are going to be very aggressive, especially as they get closer to that finish line. So um, I'm personally not ruling Miami out. Uh, but yeah, I think that there's obviously a, a you know legitimate smoke with Florida State. Uh, you know, Georgia, I think, is a school that I'm certainly not ruling out here. Uh, Florida, uh, you know, is in there. Of course, Auburn. But, you know, I guess that's kind of just where my mind is at with it right now uh, here, you know, again, Tuesday afternoon-ish. What uh outside of again we don't have to sugarcoat things in in 2023 outside of you know your nil pitches and different things like that what is Miami's real pitch to him um to get him to come play there uh on the field coaching wise things like that yeah you know just an opportunity to work under you know a defensive line coach like Jason Taylor uh you know of course Joe Salave is the defensive tackles coach but I think Jason Taylor's probably had more of a hand in this one and look uh, I think if you're Miami you kind of just say, hey, look at Ruben, what Ruben Bain's doing. Uh, he's making a tremendous impact as a true freshman, uh, leads all true freshmen in quarterback pressures with 19. Uh, TJ Parker, who's having another great year at Clemson's right behind him. Kelby Collins, who is having a great year for Florida as a true freshman, is behind him. Uh, Ruben Bain has been awesome. And uh, look, uh, obvi- uh, we don't have to get into the whole freshman and all that stuff uh, from earlier in the offseason. But look, Miami's willing to throw these guys on the field and kind of let them go. And uh, I think Miami's telling LJ McCray, like, here's the proof that you can get on the field and be tremendously impactful if if you are who we believe that you are. And if you, you know, give us basically eight months to kind of get you ready to go. Um, so I think if you're Miami, apart from the NIL pitch, which I, again, I think is going to be very, very enticing uh, at the end of the day, uh, I, I do think just what they can do for him on the field as far as just getting him ready, get, getting him developed and getting him on the field. I think that they would expect him to contribute right away. And look, if, if that's something that you're interested in doing, uh, I think Miami's proved and proven that a young guy can get on the field and be highly productive. And I mean, Ruben Bain's on all the, you know, freshman all American lists and look, LJ McCray is truthfully probably a better prospect than Ruben Bain was. And obviously Bain was highly productive at, at the high school level. So what he's doing in college isn't necessarily surprising, but LJ McCray's, you know, freaky measurables is way different than Ruben Bain, yeah. who's maybe a little bit more sought off, but very powerful with a high motor. So if you think you're a better player than Ruben Bain, which, you know, again, if you're a rankings guy, suggests that you're a better prospect. I think if you tell Ruben Bain, if this is what we did with Ruben, if, if you tell LJ McCray, if this is what we did with Ruben Bain, what can we do with you if you give us eight months and you and you put in the work and you do all the things that we believe that you're going to do because you know obviously the ch- the character and you know all the other stuff checks out that he's a good kid who's gonna make all the right decisions and and work hard. So I think if you're Miami, you know si- the pitch is simple. I mean, Jason Taylor's a Hall of Famer. He can coach. Uh, he's a fantastic coach. Uh, you get to live in Miami, which is not too bad. I mean, these guys live a pretty good life down here probably going to do well for yourself off the field and you're going to get, and you're going to play some good football, you know, at least be play be on the field um, and get a shot. So yeah, I think if you're Miami, that's, that's pretty much as simple as it gets with uh, you mentioned some of the other, you know, high profile defensive line recruitments that they've been in. They do have Jones now, but they've finished second or third in a lot of them. Do you, do you almost feel like the staff is, I, and I don't want to use desperate in like a negative connotation, right. but I mean, but like, Again, this is the last, you know, unless you flip somebody, this is the last big one. And we're getting close, you know, you only got like two months left to flip somebody at this point. And how many, how many of those guys are really flippable? Um, Do you feel like they're almost desperate again? Not, not in a negative way. I just don't know any other word to use there. No, and I don't think it's particularly negative. I think that you, it's fair to say Miami is, you know, pretty desperate. I mean, again, this was their plan. Like these aren't like, I didn't make up. I didn't like snap my fingers and decide that, you know, Miami was going to, or plan to do all these things. Like 
this is something that they wanted to do. And uh, if they don't get LJ McCray, I mean, I think it would be fair to call this defensive line, rec- maybe defensive tackle recruiting, to be fair, because they have a couple good edge rushers signed or committed. Um, you know, if it, I think you would, you can consider this defensive tackles class, you know, kind of a failure, uh, again, relative to expectations and goals. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I think there's absolutely a sense of desperation. Um, and I think that that's, I think, of, again, presenting an opportunity where they can, you know, where they're kind of pressing a little bit and, you know, they're sweetening things up and they're really trying to get LJ McCray on board. You know, I, I, I mean, there's, I think that they're going to exhaust all efforts uh, to get LJ McCray and ball's going to kind of be in his court. But, you know, Miami's going to Miami's going to do what Miami does and they're not just going to kind of tap out or just, you know, walk themselves out the door. They're going to make LJ McCray tell them, no, I think that's just the reality of it. And maybe he does. Maybe he doesn't. I I don't think we really know yet, truthfully. And again, I think inside those buildings, you know, in Coral Gables off Santa Morrow Drive, I think those guys feel like they have a puncher's chance to to get them. And they certainly don't feel like outsiders in this recruitment. Yeah. Gabby, I appreciate your time in being real quick with us. What, uh, where can people follow your work and they find your work and maybe get updates uh, over the next few days with the twists yeah. and turns on on this recruitment and more? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, you can find my work at InsideTheU.com uh, on the 24-7 Sports Network. You can find me on Twitter at Gabby Rudia, uh 247 So, yeah, I mean, if you're interested in some updates from the Miami side, uh, you know, definitely we'll be able to provide some of those for you. Cool. Well, Gabby, I appreciate it, man. Thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely, TJ. Anytime, man. All right, we're chatting with Zach Glostein of Knowles 247. Zach, um, Florida State surged in this recruitment with LJ McCray a little bit, but they also had quite an established relationship with him from the past. How how much do you think that prior relationship is kind of allowing them to surge in this recruitment late? I think a lot. I mean, FSU, like you said, was – one of the first of his finalists to offer him. I think Auburn actually was the first of the final five schools of, you know, Florida, Florida State, Miami, Georgia, and Auburn to offer a scholarship to LJ McRae. But FSU really was that first program to, you know, start recruiting him heavily. They got him on campus for a summer camp um, and then, you know, for an unofficial visit in that following season uh, last year. And, you know, they were, they were hot and heavy with him from the start you know, things kind of tailed off, but like you said, they've kind of surged in this last month or so. And I think a large reason for that is because of those pre-established relationships with certain members of the FSU coaching staff. And that's kind of allowed FSU to to really get back in the mix. Something else that certainly isn't hurting is probably their performance on the field. Have you really any insight on, you know, how, how big of a factor being six and zero right now is for, uh, for FSU and LJ? I mean, I think it's huge. Um, if you, you know, I, I put out a report this morning, you know, cliff notes of that. I just, I think right now I view FSU and Georgia um, from the people I talk to as the biggest threats right now for LJ McRae. And if you look at both of those schools, I mean, they're the only undefeated schools in his top five. Um, so I, I'd say it, it matters a ton. And you know, maybe it doesn't matter as much as, you know, some of the losses that are picking up for some of these other schools that are involved. Yeah. What about his relationship? You talked about relationships, but Odell taking a, a pretty pretty active role here, which makes a lot of sense with with his track record and LJ's position and everything else. But just Odell getting back in the mix here um, seems to be pretty huge as well. Yeah, I mean, he's kind of been vaulted into that prominent role on the coaching staff with LJ McRae. He has a great relationship with McRae's family, especially the dad, I'm told, and and, you know, The dad's a former coach as well, a guy that was just coaching at Bethune-Cookman last year. So he understands that that Odell does an awesome job developing his guys, and he also cares for his players and his position room, and and I think that matters a ton. Um, It's it's been really, really beneficial for Florida State to kind of change things up in that recruitment, have Odell kind of take the lead, and and I think that's really helped them down the stretch. Um, When... LJ was in town for his official visit. A lot of a lot of positivity coming out of that. Um, you know, you everybody has a good official visit, right? I mean, yeah. for the most part, right? You hear like horror stories and stuff, yeah. but you know, nobody goes anywhere and has like an all expenses paid vacation and like has a bad time. But Florida State certainly surged post that. But um, now that the visit high wore off, do, do you think that you know 
how important was that official visit? And, you know, was Mike maybe playing a little bit of chess, not checkers there, getting it so late in the cycle? Yeah, I mean, I, I probably wouldn't predict FSU to be, you know, where they are in this recruitment right now, if, if not for them waiting to use that official visit. Um, it was a gamble for sure, right? Like to to have a kid take four OBs in June and then not make a decision. I mean, they really had to bank on the kid telling them that, you know, he was going to wait until using that OB to make a decision that came true. So I think they, you know, it's, it's a really strong sign that they're able to read recruitments like that. And especially with this specific one, as they, as they look to close down the stretch, but absolutely. I mean, like you said, OVs always go well, but it's just the timing of it um, was perfectly placed for Florida state as kind of the final school to get um, that lasting impression on him before he makes a decision this weekend. Zach, we may have more twists and turns and no recruitment ever goes as, yeah. as smoothly as you want down the stretch, but he'll announce on Saturday. Excited for that. Um, where can people find your work? Where can they follow you and get more info uh, up to date on the LJ McRae recruitment? Yeah, we're going to be covering this thing, um, you know, from start to finish this week on knowles 247com um, You can find me on Twitter at zblostein247. Stay tuned. It's going to be a fun one. Cool. Thank you, man, very much. I appreciate it. Thanks, DJ. All right. Appreciate each of our guests for joining us today. Had a lot of good insight there. We will continue to cover this. And if you want more insight and more of an exclusive look, you can join our Patreon, patreon.com slash DFNS. That'll give you access to our Discord, where we are all the time dropping nuggets on recruiting, not only the CellJ rec recruitment, but others like it. Make sure that you're part of our Patreon. Again, DFNS at patreon.com. We appreciate you guys for your support. Appreciate you guys for tuning in and watching. Go Knowles.